the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate your interest in our uh, agenda here for this evening. Um, we have Andrew from Church World Services and Glenn Esch here this evening to share with uh, the opportunities that are available um, with refugees in the local area here. So thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a blessing to be here. I was Thinking, you know, what does, what does the Bible say about the people among us, um, the strangers among us? And uh, found some interesting, some, some verses there. Uh, one is in Leviticus, um, when a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you in, as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Proverbs 5.10 let strangers feast on your wealth and, and your toil enrich the house of another. <clears throat> and then Jesus in Matthew, um, we talked about the, the, sheep and, the sheep and the goats, and um, he set the sheep at the right and the goats on the left. And uh, he said, um, one of the, he said a lot of things there, but one of the things there was, for I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Um, I was a stranger and you took me in. So uh, there's lots of ways that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus, um, but uh, definitely getting involved with refugees is, is, is one of them, a, a really good way to, to, uh, to do that. And then Hebrews 13, uh, 1 and 2, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. So uh, some really good verses for us. Um, We'll pray and then I'll turn the time over to Andrew. And um, so, God, thank you so much for this evening and this, this opportunity to, uh, to hear about the, the opportunities around us to, to help those to share our blessings, our, our possessions, our, the things that you have entrusted to us with people who had to flee um, their land, their homes, their, their, 
their things, um, had to flee, and and now they're here, Lord, and, and we we um, we're grateful for opportunities to to be able to share with them, to be able to bless them, to um, hopefully, Lord, um, we would witness to them and and um, give them a desire to, to to know more about you, to to learn about you, to hopefully. Um, um, become born again, become children and, and children of the kingdom, Lord. So thank you so much for Andrew and, and Glenn. I pray you would bless them and, uh, and uh, just be with, uh, desire your presence here this evening, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Andrew. Oh, wow. There's a lot of people here. Uh, is it okay if I'm up here at all? You can say yes. Okay, great. Uh, my computer's up here, and so I wanted to make sure that, uh, yeah, because I will have some slides to show. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, it took me, I think, 45 minutes to get here, but that's okay. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew Mashes. I am uh, the Faith-Based Engagement Specialist with Church World Service. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we do as Church World Service, but more specifically, um, what it looks like for when people who are displaced around the world find new homes in a place like Lancaster County. Um, but I always like to start off with a little story, if that's all right. Um, so I think it was 1714. I was not alive at the time, but I've heard that um, there was a gentleman that was living in Rhineland, Germany, named Hans Nicholas Eisenhower, and uh, his family, his his extended family, had actually gotten caught up in. Um, what was a very fascinating Anabaptist movement. And so when they decided that it was finally time, due to much persecution, to finally leave their home in Germany, um, they were trying to figure out where exactly to settle. So Hans uh, actually had three sons. Um, and so due to an agreement that a lot of different groups had with particularly William Penn at the time. Um, they were allotted the chance to actually come and settle in what was then still Lancaster County, is now actually Berks County in Fredericksburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and so Hans with his three sons uh, boarded the ship Europa and they traveled across the Atlantic um, to find refuge in what was then Lancaster County. Uh, those three sons actually ended up scattering themselves. Uh, none of them stayed in Fredericksburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, one actually, um, I think one ended up migrating with a, with a group of others to um, Ontario. One actually eventually moved out towards the Kansas area and one moved up into the Wyoming Valley in northeastern Pennsylvania. The descendants of the Eisenhower that came out of the Kansas area actually gave us one of our presidents, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, the gentleman, the, the Eisenhower brother who moved up into northeastern Pennsylvania, actually uh, one of his descendants um, is me. So not that I'm as good as a president, I guess. I don't know, but um, it's kind of fast. I don't get invited to the family reunions all that often. Um, but it is a reminder to me how much of my own personal roots are tied up in this idea that this place that we all call home um, has always been a place for people to seek refuge from persecution and from violence. It is something that I think is deeply rooted in uh, our scripture. It is something you know, that God often tells his story in the Bible through the eyes of those who are displaced from their homes. So I actually wanted to read just a, a brief passage from Psalm 107. And what's interesting is from cover to cover, 
from Genesis to Revelation, so often from Eden to the Exodus to the exile to really eternity. Um, almost all of scripture, one can argue, is written through the eyes of those who are displaced. That is how God decides to tell his story and has been telling it for thousands of years. And it's really encapsulated for me in Psalm 107, verse 4, when, when uh, it is stated that some have wandered through the desert wastelands, finding no way to inhabit town. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way until they reached an inhabited town. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and the hungry he fills with good things. It is a story of wandering, of trying to find a new home. And it's interesting that it is a story that continues to this day. One can argue uh, greater than ever before. Um, so what I would like to do, very briefly, is just talk a little bit about um, the agency that I work for, Church World Service, and how we work alongside and are able to resettle refugees here to the Lancaster area, but more specifically, how you all, and there's a lot of you, I can see from up here, um, how you all can get involved in being the hands and feet of Jesus as people are trying to start new lives here in the United States. Um, there was a, a family, this was maybe about three weeks ago, um, there was a family, I think, of seven. I got a little uh, notice in my email, in my inbox, that said that there was a family of seven from the Democratic Republic of Congo that was coming. And so when this usually happens, um, as a representative of a refugee resettlement agency, my job is actually to find churches who will be willing to sponsor families. So. I did what I have come, become so accustomed to do, and I called up a church that was ready to be um, a sponsoring church. And I said, hey, there's a, there's a family of seven from the Congo. They are coming from, they're actually coming from a refugee camp in Tanzania. Are you ready? Um, you know, do, does, does your church feel ready to sponsor this family? And they said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, so about a day before they were set to arrive, um, I got another little email in my inbox, and it actually said that the family, um, that their flight was canceled. And I was like, oh man, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty tragic. I mean, this family has been waiting probably 20 years to be resettled uh, to the United States. Um, but interestingly, it, it, it did say that there was one person in the family that got on the plane. And it was the grandmother of this family. She got on the plane by herself and came to the United States. The six others, mom, dad, and, and four children, had to stay behind in Tanzania. So this was actually a little bizarre. I wasn't really sure what was, no one knew what was going on. So we waited until she landed. Um, we went to the airport to greet her, and she was by herself you know, expecting to have her kids and her grandkids to be with her. And so it actually turned out that there was, um, yeah, one of the members of the family actually had tested positive for COVID-19 and were not able to get onto the plane. And so they got, so luckily, um, not something super drastic necessarily. They were able to get their flight rescheduled for the next week. Okay, great. So uh, the grandmother is now, is yes, by herself uh, in this apartment by herself. Um, and luckily I was working with an amazing church sponsoring group that was checking in on her every day and making sure that she was 
eating right and wasn't getting too depressed and, and was really trying to lift her spirits. Um, so a week went by and we got ready again for this family to come. And then their flight got canceled again. Okay. Um, we found out it was for the same, the same issue, so they decided actually to postpone the flights for two more weeks. Okay, so we waited. Um, meanwhile, we kept telling um, this grandmother that your children will come. Um, and she was starting to get a little suspicious that that was actually true. So two weeks went by, and yes, their flight got canceled a third time. Um, and it was getting very demoralizing at this point. Um, we weren't really sure what to do. Uh, were they ever going to get to come? We honestly didn't know. Um, what do we say to this grandmother who's now living in this four bedroom apartment by herself? Um, I mean, with the occasional church person that comes by to make sure she's okay, but um, in a whole new land where she doesn't know the language, she doesn't know the culture, she doesn't know really anyone else. And so the church said that they, they visited her one night and she broke down and, and cried in desperation, hoping that the family would come. So they sang hymns together as a way to try to essentially pray for this family to be able to come. Um, they quietly, you know, she didn't speak English, they didn't speak Swahili, but they were able to sing hymns together. And luckily, a week later, the family did finally arrive. I almost couldn't, when I, when I, I was able to track the flight on, on the internet, um, when it actually said that it landed in New York, I was kind of stunned that it was actually happening. And I can remember we, we brought the grandmother to go greet them at the airport, um, and it was a very emotional, very emotional moment. Um, a lot of hugging um, and tears and actually, I mean, literal praises to, to the skies, to the heavens. And so it reminded me that why I do the work that I do, and more specifically, the role that the church can play in this work, how crucial it is for followers of Jesus to be those hands and feet in, in, in these kinds of situations. And sometimes I actually wake up every day, I still can't believe I get to do what I get to do, honestly. Um, but what I wanted to do real quick um, is talk a little bit about um, who a refugee is. Oh, did it shut off? Oh, dear. That would be, that would be great. I mean, it's okay. It's fine. Oh, good. Okay. Whew. It worked. Okay. I'm not sure why it's doing that specifically, but is it okay? If, I mean, is there, is there something on ending slideshow? Display settings. Yeah, just swap. Yeah, it won't click on it. Hmm. Who loves computers? Yeah, it's not clicking. Mm -mm. Hold on. Let me try one more. That is really bizarre. You just do it again. There we go. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Whew. So, where was I? Sorry about that. Uh, Church World Service actually has been in existence since 1946. 
um, a group of various denominations actually decided to band together after World War II and work on post-World War II reconstruction relief efforts in Western and Eastern Europe. And the idea behind it was that um, various uh, mainline Christian denominations in the United States could do various relief efforts, whether it was Lutheran or, or the Episcopal Church or Presbyterian. Um, doing relief efforts was fine um, individually or by themselves, but the idea was that they could do, do a lot more together. So they formed this coalition, this, this group, Church World Service, um, to do those efforts. And Church World Service eventually became one of nine resettlement agencies, one of the nine original resettlement agencies for the refugee resettlement program in the United States when it was instituted, I think, in 19, originally 1952 and then later in 1980. Um, but we do work in various parts of the world, working in food, water, disaster response, and recovery, and more specifically for, for, our, for this evening, um, what we'll be talking about tonight is assisting refugees and the vulnerable. We are more than active in, in 30 countries, and like I said, we are one of nine refugee resettlement agencies. Our... Our philosophy is that all families deserve safety and dignity, um, and we're committed to showing welcome to refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers, and other uprooted people within the United States. Um, currently, um, these numbers are extremely overwhelming when we look at um, the world stage. Oh. I mean, ask them, they're the ones looking. Um, so here's what's interesting about this slide. This slide is about a year old. Um, you know, usually this is the part where I say, well, there are 82, over 82 million displaced people worldwide and 26 million of those are classified as refugees. Um, Unfortunately, um, in just one year's time, this number has jumped up um, to around 30 million because there has been almost around 4 million people from the Ukraine who have now been displaced um, in the last two months um, and would sort of qualify and classify under that refugee category. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fascinating how quickly these numbers um, change and shift. Um, and so refugees today are defined as people who flee their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution based on their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Um, I think the United Nations def made that definition in 1951. Um, and essentially, refugees are given three options when they originally flee their home. Um, the first and most desired outcome is that actually they will get to return home someday um, after being displaced. Um, I remember asking a, a, a very dear friend of mine from Somalia uh, who was resettled in Lancaster many years ago, and I asked him, I said, if you don't mind me asking, I'm just, just asking, you know, did you ever think about what it would mean to go back home to Somalia. So I think he fled when he was around 10 years old. He was in his mid-20s at the time that I was having this conversation with him. And he said, well, let me ask you, let me ask you this question. Um, he said, do you remember when uh, you know, Bill Clinton became president, uh, the first time he became president? I said, yeah, I was six. I was six years old uh, in 1992. Um, and it was a year later, actually, that um, the civil war in Somalia started. And he said, you're six now. You're, th you're not six now. You were six then. I'm 35 now. Um, that war has not ended. Um, the, play, you know, the country of Somalia is not necessarily deemed a livable place. Um, 
And so it's not always as easy as just the idea of being able to go back home. Um, this fear, this well-founded fear of persecution or violence is well-founded and can be for many, many decades. And so typically when refugees do flee, they will flee into a bordering country. For him, it was the border country of Kenya. For a lot of um, people coming from, say, Syria, it's places like Egypt or Jordan. But where we play a, a, an interesting role is this third option, resettling permanently into a third country, which is the United States. Um, and so I'll just kind of go through. So often um, we are being told that the United States is set to resettle more refugees in this upcoming year than it has in any given year in the last 30 years, if that makes sense. So every year, um, the United States sets a goal for how many refugees they want to admit into the United States, and the number that was set for this upcoming year, the number has not been that high since 1992. So when people ask me, is there a need at Church World Service to sponsor families, um, it, it's once in a generation, in my, in my opinion, um, a once in a generation need. And so people get involved in a variety of different ways, um, volunteering, donating, but what I was actually hoping to kind of talk about a little bit here, and I think hopefully with the help of Glenn, um, in, in hearing some of his story about how he has been involved in this work, mobilizing uh, various churches and groups to help sponsor families, really is being able to be a place where um, refugees can find home and hope and hopefully a new life, just like Hans Nicholas Eisenhower with his three sons was able to find. Um, so actually, Glenn, if, is it all right if you share? No. Yeah, because I did want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, but um, I always think that story really kind of, instead of all the technical stuff, is what really gets at the heart of the work that we do, if that's all right. things here. Well, it's good to see all you here. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit how we got involved <clears throat> and uh, then maybe a few things about it. Um, it's an exciting work and so, you know, a number of years ago, um, I didn't really have a lot of interaction with other cultures and, and those types of things. Yes, mom and dad um, had students on Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas, and that did plant a seed. Um, <clears throat> and so we got to see, uh, have Chinese, uh, Chinese people at our home or um, wherever. Um, and that did uh, plant a seed in my heart. And, and I would encourage all parents and families uh, to, to think about some of those things that you do at home, uh, they may be simple, um, are planting seeds in your children's life that will blossom into something else. But <clears throat> we got involved in um, other cultures uh, through my work. And so uh, we have actually um, a software development team in Central Asia. And uh, so we have, uh, we've lived over there some and uh, we're back and forth and I communicate with them every day. Um, and that kind of got my interest in uh, Central Asian um, <clears throat> people. 
And then um, when this whole thing went down with Afghans, well, Afghanistan is Central Asia. Uh, where we're at is not actually too far from uh, Afghanistan if we, when we travel over to, uh, to Central Asia. And um, it just really sparked my interest. <clears throat> but going back two years, there was something God was doing in the heart of our church that was, um, he was putting this together for this moment, I believe, and for the moments following. And who knows what the story will be in years to come. <clears throat> Um, you know, we're, we're called to love and to care no matter what. If we look in the scriptures, we're called to care no matter what. And, uh, and we call that agape love, um, it, and we talk about the different types of love. But John wrote in his epistle, he said, God is love. That is, that's who God is. He is love. And um, this is, you know, what does he mean when he says God is love? <clears throat> well, um, he, he even looks at his enemies and it says, um, for who revile us and persecute us and say all manner of evil against us falsely? That's the tough one. Um, and we're supposed to love anyway? You see, it's no matter what. We're supposed to love. <clears throat> and, you know, he, he places his spirit within us the Holy Spirit lives and abides with us. And when that happens, there's something comes out of our lives. What is it? You know it. Say it. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Keep going. Joy. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Meekness. Faithfulness, um, those things come out of us when we have the Holy Spirit in us, right? And um, that's what it means to be a Christian. <clears throat> that's really what it means to be a Christian is when those things come out of us because the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And so God calls us to do different things so that we can demonstrate that gift, uh, those gifts and those fruits of the Holy Spirit. He calls us to different things. And one of those is um, th uh, showing love, joy, peace, uh, whatever, to these refugees. <clears throat> now, not everybody's supposed to have refugees. No, not everybody's supposed to take care of refugees. We can't all be passionate about refugees, but uh, there's a big enough crowd here, I think, um, that some of you, at least, are supposed to take care of refugees. God's calling something here. And so um, I think it's important for us to understand <clears throat> that we are being called, because sometimes it's difficult because you have to replace what you used to do, because time is not elastic, with what you now are called to do. And when you have to make those decisions, it's good to know that this is what God is calling you to, <clears throat> because it is a commitment. Whatever God has called us to do, we're all supposed to encourage one another. So just because I'm taking care of refugees and someone is taking care of some, uh, something else doesn't mean one is better than the other. It just means that's what God has called us to. And that's what uh, the, bringing those together and we encourage each other in the church uh, helps us. So you're, those who are going to be called into it are going to also need encouragement from other people. <clears throat> so keep that in mind. Um, 
Some of you should not make this commitment of welcoming refugees. I probably shouldn't say this, Andrew, but that's the case. Some of you shouldn't, but some of you definitely should. And all along, we want to encourage each other in this whole thing of um, bearing fruit. So let's concentrate on the thing of fruit bearing. What's fruit bearing? It's love, joy, peace, long suffering, so on, right? <clears throat> And the interesting thing about that is, how does that verse end up? What does it say? Against such there is no law. Such, is no law. That means that it doesn't matter where you live, you can still exercise the fruit of the Spirit and be free to do so. It doesn't matter if you're in Afghanistan, where it's now very difficult for Christians to live, you can still display love, joy, peace, long-suffering. There's no law against those things. <clears throat> Even in Iran or North Korea or wherever. And for sure not here in the United States. <clears throat> and for many refugees that come from war-torn places, and you know, those of our families have, have told us of some of this stuff. Uh, we don't necessarily push them to, uh, to tell us, but as you get to know them, um, they tell us of the difficult things that they come through. Uh, there was one family that we didn't necessarily have as a welcoming team, but we were doing some things with us, and as I was taking his family home, his um, son was shooting something, and uh, what was he, eight, nine years old? <clears throat> and then he was saying something, and I didn't know what he was saying, but his father was saying he's talking about the Taliban and what they, he saw. And really, at that age, he shouldn't have been seeing those things. And they've come through some uh, very difficult uh, th times. And what better time to introduce to someone what the fruits of the Spirit, love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, because they haven't experienced some of this, uh, these things. <clears throat> so about two years ago, it was in November, and um, we had a call um, to, can we take some students for the weekend? And... That um, November, we usually have students in our home because that was a seed planted by our, um, my parents. And, and uh, we couldn't do it that time. And so we, uh, we said, well, maybe we can get someone in our church. And I love how God prepares us as people to do his work. <laughs> um, so Christy from our church, Christy, Christy Good, was reading Matthew 25. And in Matthew 25, it says uh, this, um, I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. And as she was going through this, she was checking them off. Well, yeah, these are things uh, that I can do. I can help feed the hungry uh, and the thirsty. And I can maybe help clothe the naked. And I can maybe visit the sick. And maybe do something uh, with prison ministry. But she looked at that thing of, I was a stranger. And she says, we can't do that in our stage of life. I, I can't bring a, sta a stranger in my house. Um, I can't do this right now. That's probably something I'll need to do later. <clears throat> she actually went through those things on Saturday. And on Sunday, um, I got up and I announced this thing of could someone host a student? 
And she said, right there and then, she knew what God was calling her to do. God was calling her to do the thing that she said she couldn't really do. And she kind of fought with it, but she knew deep down in her heart that definitely was the thing she needed to do. <clears throat> and so she decided to yeah, say yes. Um, we could take a student, and um, she didn't know who she was getting, but she ended up getting an Afghan student. <clears throat> and she, uh, they, they had her for the weekend and really entered into a relationship with this student and has been connected with her over the two years. And, and then came up the Afghan uh, crisis. And uh, they started talking more. And her, uh, Zenora is uh, um, the lady that she was, uh, the student that she was in contact with, was telling her how her family in Afghanistan was having these uh, difficult times and they were hiding and could not go to their jobs anymore and they were getting down to their last morsel of food and needed help and they didn't know what to do. Um, uh, her and her family here in the United States were doing everything they could, taking up little jobs just to send money back, but it wasn't enough. And she said, can you please help? And so our church entered into this. And this sparked some more things as uh, the, this refugee crisis came into uh, play. And, and we said, well, can we help in this way? And so the Martindale District got, uh, got involved in this. And it's been such a good thing um, to, to be involved with. One thing, a few things um, that I uh, see as we uh, connect together with, uh, with the Afghans is they're people. They're people just like us. And I know you, you may have some other nationality. We ended up with Afghan refugees, uh, four families that our district uh, put together, and then there was a few other churches that uh, came uh, involved in it also. But it's been nothing uh, but a blessing. I. Um, think of a, a one couple who we didn't have housing in time for for some of these um, families and they said well they had just married off their last child they were empty nesters now and um, this came up in church and they were like I don't know Afghans that's kind of scary um, but they said yes to the call and so in December, the first family came and uh, stayed there for a little while. And then his brother came. And they overlapped for a week. But now uh, the, the, the brother is in their home. And the impact that they're having there is just phenomenal. Um, the spiritual conversations that they can have just because they live together. You know, there's this thing, <clears throat> we want all men to be saved, as Paul said. We want all men to be saved. But that's really not our job. Yes, I'm saying that. That's not really our job. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict and to convert. But he does ask us to show love and to tell the truth about Jesus. But it's not this thing that you go in there with an agenda that you're going to preach to them or anything like that. In fact, I would say don't do it. What I have found the, to be one of the, the greatest things uh, to <clears throat> do is that you listen and you're alert for spiritual questions or for opportunities. And if there are none, you do nothing. You keep on loving, that's all you do. You don't go preaching. And uh, since um, where I've gotten this is from Henry Blackby, and I don't have much time to, uh, to go into that, but um, 
in my contacts that I've had with, uh, especially Muslims, um, this just works. And it's such a freedom. I'm not putting something together that feels um, coerced and stuffed in, but it's all natural. And that is, we are alert to spiritual questions. Let me just give you a, a, an illustration, or to questions that can t uh, give you of your, of where you could uh, share your faith. So uh, I travel sometimes to Central Asia, and I was uh, invited to um, one of my programmers' places. And all evening, I was listening and watching for the spiritual question that might come up. And, and um, we went around his farm. He talked about a lot of things, met his family, all those kinds of things. And then it was supper time, kind of late in the evening. And I was there with him, his uncle, and we were uh, talking and conversing about some things. And then out of the blue, just out of the blue, he said, are you a Catholic? And I knew right there, that's my time to engage in a spiritual question. And um, he said, I, I, I explained to him the difference uh, between us and and a Catholic, and his uncle went away, and after a while, he, uh, the, my programmer started talking to me and how that Islam is just a fake, and um, people go to the mosque just because they want to be seen, and if nobody be looking, they wouldn't be doing it, and they pray just to be seen and so on. I had no idea he was this and disenchanted with Islam, but he was ready for something, and I told him, uh, uh, was able to connect with him about what I believe. Um, nothing forced, all natural. <clears throat> what I do know, though, is that these things don't come up by talking about the weather. They come up when we love each other and when we honor each other and when we do life together. And I think that's what this is about. Just last week, <clears throat> I was at our Afghan family, and I was uh, just explaining to them, they don't speak English very well, they're just learning in the last two months. Um, and I was explaining to him that he doesn't need to go to work on Friday because it's a holiday. And I didn't expect to go into any explanation, so, because I don't force things. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit does the work uh, when they're ready. And uh, then um, he said, why is it a holiday? And I said, do you want to know the story? And I want, I want to be very open and honest, because these are Muslims, and I understand what they believe. <clears throat> I said, do you want to know, the uh, to know the story behind it? They said, yes. And so two weeks before, I had downloaded the Dari um, Bible on my, on my um, phone, and it has an audio. And I said, OK, I'll, pl I'll play you the story. And I went to John 19, and I, I played the audio for them. And uh, right away, the, the children came around and looked at it, and, and soon his wife was there. Uh, reading uh, the diary on my phone and listening to it. <clears throat> and um, then I said, and Sunday is a holiday too. Do you want to hear the story of that part of the holiday? And, and they said, yes, uh, we want to hear. And so I went to John 20, and I played um, the Easter story. And then I said, would you want this so that you can listen to it yourself? And they said, yes, yes, we, we would like to have that. And so I downloaded the app. You know, there's just things like this. We don't know what uh, God is doing in their hearts. I can barely communicate um, with it. But there's things like this. And when we get involved in people's lives, I am convinced that they will start asking spiritual questions, and that's our cue to start. And before that, don't run a guilt trip that you're not saying something about the gospel or whatever. 
wait for the spiritual question uh, to come up. It's freeing and it's effective. And I'm excited that, you know, I was thinking about it. Central Asia is a very difficult place to be. Um, it's hard to get in, and especially Afghanistan. <clears throat> and I was thinking about it. You know, we look at the catastrophe and the crisis, and we say, why in the world, God, would you allow something this bad to happen? Why would you do this? And God is a master at t uh, turning ashes into beauty. And you might be a part of that. You might be a part of turning ashes into beauty. You see, we couldn't enter into Afghanistan, or a lot of us couldn't. But when Jesus said, go ye therefore teach all nations, I had no idea that meant that the nations would come to us here in Lancaster County. And I think, am I right, Andrew, that Lancaster is the capital of uh, the refugee capital of the United States. There's no other city uh, in the United States that has a higher population of refugees per capita. Is, am I correct? Yeah, okay. What an opportunity we have. The nations are coming to us. So. Ah, thanks, Glenn. Um, it has been I, <clears throat> an absolute joy to work with uh, Glenn and um, the churches that he's been able to mobilize and the groups of people. Um, and I, I, I've lost count, honestly, at this rate, how many families they've actually welcomed from Afghanistan. I think, you know, through all of the different connections, it's got to at least be six or that I've, I've, I've lost count. So what exactly is it that we're talking about here? What does this look like practically? Um, you know, I know that there's probably many people here who um, attend this church. There might be people here who attend a different church. And you heard about this going on, and so you decided to come and check it out. So the thing that we're talking about, really, I think is being able to find really a small group of people, relatively small group of people from your church um, who would like to take this next step, uh, this leap of faith, if you will, in being able to sponsor and help resettle just one family um, while they basically um, begin to start new lives in the United States. Um, you know, Glenn, Glenn certainly uh, illustrated it quite well in saying that, you know, the nations have come to us. Um, for 10 years, I, I worked for an organization where my entire drive in life every day of waking up was to try to get people from Lancaster County to basically go to other parts of the world and share the gospel. And my job now is to try to convince the churches of Lancaster County to allow the world to come to it. Um, and I think what is so fascinating to me is when I often ask people here, you know, Glenn alluded to the fact that we um, can claim that we are the refugee capital of the world. Per capita, we resettle more refugees. And I'm still going to stand by that statistic until someone tells me otherwise. Um, per capita than any other city or county in the United States. And it's so fascinating to me when I often ask people to do this kind of work, the answer is almost always, it's just what we do. Um, it has been going on now for 300 years here. Um, and I do believe that God is, is setting a time such as this for a new generation, hopefully, and a new era um, for people from around the world to come and seek refuge and find hope, healing, and safety here um, in Lancaster. That was a lot of talking. Okay. Um, so that was a lot of information. Thank you, Glenn, for um, 
those testimonials. Certainly, um, bringing us back to the fruits of the Holy Spirit is always a good, good way to go. Um, I should remind my son of those, my five-year-old, um, when he gets in trouble at school, about the, like he did today. But anyway, I'll save that for later. So actually, what I wanted to do, um, if there was still time, I don't know what kind of other things we, we had arranged, but I often find that this line of work um, tends to generate a lot of questions. And yes, there are a lot of very finite details that we don't really need to even get into necessarily um, about how this all works. Like, well, what, you know, how do, what, what do we do about housing? What do we do about a job? Um, yeah, we can talk about those things a little bit, but this is sort of a space really to, um, yeah, field any questions that you might have on how to get involved further um, and how we can hopefully partner together. Um, Chris, is, Chris has a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like it'd be important to mention. Um, so basically, yeah. So when I say, you know, when I talk about getting your churches involved, finding small groups of people, um, the, the, the banner that we use or the, the term that we use, we call it, um, them welcome teams. And typically, I, I basically advocate that people find... I always try to look for like what's a magic number of people who could possibly kind of create a core group of a welcome team from a church. I usually say around 8 to 12. Um, that's not really rooted in any kind of math or science. I just kind of made it up, um, mostly because it seems like a, a, a healthy number where, um, yeah, there's not just one person kind of doing everything. And so you're able to kind of delineate responsibilities. And so the idea is that from the time that a family arrives to the time that they are hopefully deemed self-sufficient, um, this welcome team is walking alongside the family um, during that entire process. Um, so it could look like a variety of different things, um, from helping furnish an apartment um, to actually making the apartment look nice um, before the family is to arrive to actually greeting the family when they arrive at the airport. That's my favorite day. My five-year-old always knows when it's airport day because I'm just in a better mood. Um, I really do love airport day. Um, but being that first face when the family actually arrives in the United States, which was, that's how it was explained to me by my friend from Somalia, which was a very overwhelming thought. He said, you know, you're going to be the first face that these families see when they enter the United States. I'm like, I don't know if they want to see this face. Um, but okay, um, and so doing, doing things like taking to medical appointments and helping the kids enroll in school, uh, working at transportation, showing families the grocery store and how to use American currency. Um, oh man, there's just a whole host of, of various things, but there is a process. Um, and so if there is, let's say, a group of eight to 12 people from your church or your family or just people that you know, um, yeah. Contacting myself, um, you know, I can get people started sort of on the process to kind of work on um, filling out a fairly, fairly simple application and um, working at some cross-cultural orientation dynamics and really learning more about who refugees are. Um, once that process is done, it's a little bit of a waiting game. You never know really day-to-day I mean, I never know when families are coming and we get, we've actually been getting a decent amount of notice, like two weeks, which is kind of nice. Um, but before, for, for, for the families that Glenn was paired up with, I think it was like two days sometimes, where I'd call Glenn up and say, I need, you know, I've got another family, they're coming like on Wednesday. Um, and so then it's go time, then it's time for the group to, to rally and get ready. Um, so yeah, be that uh, welcoming, welcoming presence and face. Do they, when the family comes, do they have lunch? Yeah, great question. So um, 
the federal government administers the refugee resettlement program, and so for every family that arrives, they're given essentially a grant that for the most part covers very basic necessities, um, almost exclusively rent and utilities for around six months um, while, yeah, families are, are starting to look for a job and learning how to budget and stuff like that. Um, so there is, there is an allotted amount. So early they only get money for about six months. Mm -hmm. Yep. With, with the caveat, the idea that they should be self-sufficient by, by that time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there are some families that are genuinely getting there faster. So um, some of the jobs uh, around for us have been uh, Ray Tech in uh, Hinkletown, um, Superior Plastics. Um, our family is with MK Martin Eggs. So it's just uh, connections that we had in our church um, that helped us connect. So that's another thing you know you may not be called uh, to be a welcome team person but you may be called to hire someone if you have a business <clears throat> uh, yeah i mean businesses big and small i mean i don't know how far we are from that huge urban outfitters uh place and gap from here but a lot of, they actually do hire a lot of um you know of our of our refugee clients and then small businesses too from um, yeah, candy stores to marketing companies, for example. Um, yeah, we'll hire we'll hire our clients as well. But I should say, I do want to sort of caveat a little bit with that that Church World Service does have a rather extensive employment services program. It's not a prerequisite. I think a lot of people get. Um, wrapped up in this idea of mean to find housing and jobs um you know we also do have staff that work at those things rather tirelessly look like those are not fully put on to the sponsoring church themselves so you're saying you have sometimes housing you're constantly looking for housing oh every day yeah um and, and what was fascinating what something that glenn said you know we're kind of in this interesting time where um you know, it's like kind of like a pendulum where, um, yeah, there is an abundance, it seems, of jobs. Um, you know, actually, a lot of places are giving sign-on bonuses and, and, you know, rather uh, decent living wages. Um, but on the other side, there is, it is a struggle to find affordable housing um, in any part of the, the county, to be honest, um, not just Lancaster City. Um, so yeah, that's always a, a fun part of the work as well. So from the start, the first thing a uh, welcome team does is what? Find housing? So no, the first thing that the welcome team does is contact me, which I can um, sort of leave right. that contact information. Yep. So often what I tell groups is actually not necessarily looking for housing, but trying to gather things that you'll fill the house with. Furniture, household items, dishes, um, yeah, all kinds of stuff. We will you know, continue to work with um, any leads that we have on housing. Um, but yeah, just know that that is like, finding housing is not the sole responsibility of the church or welcome team either. So schooling, yeah. They can't speak English. Right. So schooling often actually does take a little bit of time. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the school year. Um, so families that, I think there's a family arriving in two weeks. I don't even know if their kids are going to get enrolled in school 
for this year. Um, and so there's a lot of steps that have to happen, medical appointments, um, they actually need to get a permanent residence before they can enroll in school. Um, and the school districts, depending on you know, where a family is settled, has various resources on, on English language um, learning. I think most of them do a fairly good job of, I mean, just the immersion alone for the children being in the school system allows them to pick up English, I think, pretty quick. And often, I don't know if you've experienced this yet, Glenn, I and mean, it's still kind of early on, but often a year, down the a year down the road, you'll find that the kids are becoming the interpreters for the parents um, because they've just grasped language that much quicker. So I didn't resettle a, a refugee. I uh, was a green card holder. And um, the children came at, and were in the Pequa Valley School District. They have a very good program. And um, they were speaking English months after. It, was, it really did not take that long for the children. I was really surprised. <clears throat> Yeah, so the short answer is yes. Um, and I think, yeah, we would want to work with the churches kind of, you know, the groups that are in those areas to really assess, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of housing is available in those, in those areas or jobs or um, transportation kind of opportunities. I mean, a lot of the families that, that Glenn helped resettled ended up in Ephrata. Um, and so, yeah, they're kind of navigating on what that kind of looks like, um, even though that's still relatively close to Lancaster. But yeah, because to be perfectly honest, we're kind of, you know, we always like to be able to house families in the city of Lancaster just because um, it's convenient for families with public transportation and stuff, but there's just not a lot of room. Yeah, so that's actually what has made um, this situation in Ephrata so great, honestly, because it's more than one family that has, um, I mean, there is one that's in the city, technically, um, but you guys have done a great job of kind of bringing them to different social events and like the stuff at Woodcrest, for example, and, and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I think for an area, you know, coming out this far, I actually would be more intrigued to resettle more than one family um, of the same ethnic group or culture. We did actually about three weeks ago, we set a Congolese family up in Lebanon. Um, and that was a stretch for us because it's, you know, decently far, I guess, from, um, from Lancaster. But it was very apparent early on that the family was, the family themselves were asking, you know, when will more Congolese come to Lebanon? Um, and so we're hoping that we can get more families into that area. Mm -hmm. I think so. They they should. St I mean, they signed a year lease, so um, that was interest. That was an interesting endeavor because they there is a large Syrian community in Lancaster, and they they wanted to be in Lancaster. Um, it really depends on the. F I've had families who don't want anything to do with Lancaster City, um, and I've I've seen some families where. They, that's all they want to, that's all where they want to be. It's so different. What are the main ethnic groups that you're, that are coming at this time? Yeah, so the, the, the main three, I mean, we, we are still hoping to resettle a few more families from Afghanistan. Um, it's really slowed down for the families from Afghanistan now. Um, but I would say uh, still there's a lot of Congolese families, Syria, and actually there should be a decent amount 
coming possibly from Central America um, as well, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, places like that. Um, so yeah, there's, they, they sort of are able to qualify for um, refugee status and wait for several years because of a lot of gang violence and drug violence that's happening in Central America. Um, my hope is that we can continue. Uh, my personal uh, heart is with the Somali community um, and we have not reset, Lancaster has not resettled this family from Somalia in I don't know, maybe half a decade by now. Um, and so my hope is that we'll be able to do that hopefully soon as well. We used to sell, we sell a lot, um, but that kind of took a turn for a while. You can say it. Um, yeah, um, I, I always try to take those things into consideration um, as best as I can. Um, it's just so hard to know what what's going to come down the, the pipeline. Um, yeah, I do my best to try to keep those considerations, um, especially if there's someone on the team who might have an affinity for a specific language or culture that they've had experience with, especially. Um, one of the things that made the Congolese family work in Lebanon is because there were two people on the welcome team that spoke Swahili. Um, that was great. Um, and so, yeah, those, there, there are some considerations I try to make. Yes, sir. That is, I ask myself that every day. Um, because, yeah, I honestly don't know. Um, to be bluntly honest, it could be years before we start seeing families from Ukraine go through the refugee process. Um, I know that there's been a statement made that we're going to resettle, I forget how many it was, 100,000. There wasn't really a timetable put on that, and the, the process to do that could take years. Um, so right now, what we're mostly seeing is actually a lot of the Ukrainian families that are in, like, Ephrata. There's, there's sort of a large Slavic community um, up in that area. Um, there's been some pathways for them to be able to bring some family members over. Um, but yeah, it's a long, it's a long haul. I think the reason that with Afghanistan that made it so unique, I mean, I know it was so unique, was because they were literally airlifted out by the U.S. military to the United States. So I had... When, when I was explaining things to our church, uh, one thing that came up is there was this fear of the kind of unknown. And it was an unknown. And, and that's something you just have to step into. So I, I encourage you, step into it. Uh, church World Services does a really good job of just coming alongside of you. So uh, you can step into it. <clears throat> He's right. I have no idea what I'm, what I'm going to do any day of the week. I wake up and every day and is, is certainly an adventure. And you get used to it. So with the family, would there, would there be like a family that you saw, soon realized you're taking advantage? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does that happen? Or, so if that would happen, do we call you and, and say, hey, what do we do in this situation? Or? Yeah. So, I mean, that's loaded question. So, um, yeah, I think what well, we are always uh, continuing to coach, I guess, uh, council, um, welcome teams and churches is to, um, yeah, being mindful about what it will look like for the families to be able to be essentially independent, right? I mean, that is, that is the goal. Um, Financially, they only have a certain amount of time before they have to be. 
Um, and so working with families around this philosophy around, I guess, showing how to do things instead of doing um, is a, it's a fun balance to, to it's a fine line to walk. Um, a good, okay, so a really quick example. So there was this uh, single mother, um, bless her heart, she, had, she came with six children. She wasn't able to bring her husband here. They came from a refugee camp in Tanzania. And the church, the, the welcome team that they were working with, she had six kids. Four of them were in, of school age. And so they were housed in Lancaster City, and they actually couldn't, they don't bus in, in Lancaster City. So they had to walk, um, I think, like three quarters of a mile or something every day, um, rain or shine, you know. And so there was this uh, very nice woman on their welcome team, on her welcome team, that would come every morning and walk the kids to school and then walk them, you know, come back in the afternoon and walk them. And she was doing this for weeks. And so we, we kind of, we, we sort of backhandedly found out about this. We were like, what, you know, why, why are you, you know, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be doing that. Um, you know, I think it's time where we kind of teach the mother like the exact route and make sure that she's able to take her kids to, to school. And, and one of the things that she said, this welcome team member said to me, she said, well, every time that I ask her if she wants me to walk her kids to school, she says yes. I was like, well, yeah, she's going to say yes. Um, that's good. Yeah, that's just going to happen because she's a human being. Um, and so, yeah, there, there, there are so many things that I think people want to do out of the, you know, they want to be helpful, they want to um, be kind, but there also is an element of being able to make sure that people can, yeah, do things on their own. Yeah, they would. Um, I think like with any human being, there's a um, differing sense of independence with, with every human being. Um, you know, my, I hate to compare um, full-grown adults to, to children, but I often think of my own children. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, um, and my five-year-old will let his mother brush his teeth um, I think until he's married at this rate, um, I swear. Um, so I, don't, I didn't mean to say that. I don't swear. Um, not in Amish church anyway. Um, so, uh, but my but what's so fascinating is my two-year-old. He will grab that toothbrush, and he'll just. I mean, he doesn't do it right, but you know, he he goes to town on it, and and I'm just like, look at your brother. Um, and so I think the short answer is yes. They, they, they really do. They, they know that this is a significant time in their lives where they have the ability to start over and, and, and start anew. And some are very determined to do that. Um, and I think we, the joy that we get to have is just being able to be alongside them as they, as they navigate that. So are they affected by, most of these come from the refugee camp, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, that there is an element that makes this work sort of extra challenging. Um, sort of as Glenn was alluding to, the things that they've experienced, the trauma that they've experienced, is let's be honest, things that we'll never have to experience. Hopefully, never have to experience. Um, the story that Glenn told about about that son, about the child, and. and pretending about shooting the talent, I mean, that, that just t t eats, me, eats me away. Um, and yeah, um, there is sometimes for many a steep learning curve if they've been in refugee camps for, for many, many years. But at, but at the end of the day, 
it does work out. I think we get, I think sometimes welcome teams in churches, they get very, I don't know, for lack of a better term, anxious about um, families being able to, yeah, do things on their own or, or, or lead routine normal lives, and things do work out. So does uh, that welcome team, is there a separation that starts happening? Yeah, so what I often tell folks is that, you know, when, they, when families are no longer enrolled in CWS program, the first thing that I don't want to see happen is for the welcome team to just say, okay, bye, we're never going to talk to you again. Um, the, whole, the whole idea around this is to build relationships and friendships, um, but the relationship is different. Um, so when, they, when, when families um, are no longer enrolled in our program, usually that's when we talk with the churches and teams about transitioning that relationship. So it's around six, I mean, on average, six months. Um, depends on when they're deemed self-sufficient based on their income and, um, yeah, but I'd say on average, six months. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a lot of great, um, I will say that, that Lancaster has a very amazing, um, sometimes what I call resettlement ecosystem, where there's all kinds of different organizations that are kind of playing a piece of, of the puzzle in some way. I mean, there's a lot of ESL classes for adults. Um, some will hold them like right in their homes. Um, so yeah, to, you know, there, there's food banks and, and clothing banks and, um, that we also contract with, um, you know, that we can't, you know, we don't have a clothing bank at Church World Service, but we work with, actually it's right over down here on 340, um, the one that we uh, contract with for, for folks to go to. So there's, a, yeah, a lot of resources for, for families to get on their feet. Yeah, so, um, yeah, there's a set of benefits, public benefits that all families are allotted when they come, including medical assistance. Um, and the union community care is, the, is typically the, the health system that we partner with. There's one, I don't think there's one out here. Uh, but there's, yeah, there is one in New Holland, yeah. And Ephrata, uh, I think. No? I made that up. Yeah, I was thinking, there actually is one in Lebanon. Um, that's what I was thinking of. But, um, yeah, so, and there's other various healthcare providers that, you know, we can work with if there's not a union community care in that immediate area. How are the kids doing? They, they sound like the, I mean, Mine would be gone by now. So, yeah, lastly, I, I mean, I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't just say, um, walk into this with some open hands, possibly. Um, see where God leads. Um, I think you will be really surprised at um, the areas in which he will nudge you just to take a fairly simple step, um, but also open your eyes to uh, a whole new world right at your doorstep. Yes, sir.
Mm -hmm. So sometimes we get, um, especially if we're involved on the field somewhere, maybe we, we see where the money was misused here, and then we say, oh, it's misused over here, and we say, well, where can I give? You know, I don't want to give there, can't give overseas because I can't be there to see how to use it, and the organization that they gave to there was something bad happened there, so I don't want to give there. And uh, we said, well, maybe we should just give to my own church at home. Well, what are we going to do with the money? You know, so I think as Christians, sometimes we, we look at where, where should we give. And one of the things I think that attracts me with this opportunity is that we have an opportunity right here to perhaps be involved with the actual giving out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I find this line of work to be so fascinating. I, I don't come up here asking, uh, as a nonprofit, asking for um, necessarily even your money. I'm asking for yourselves. Um, and that kind of changes, I think, things um, quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a and that's a very good question, a fair question. Um, the short answer is um, there are essentially extended service programs that some families can enroll in if they are deemed by CWS as needing that additional support. Um, usually that is a r focused more around ongoing chronic health issues, actually, that are difficult for families to navigate. Um, and so they will you know, continue being enrolled in um, case management services, maybe sometimes up to two years. But that does not come with, in any way, additional financial support. That is just integration, uh, resourcing or navigation, let's say. Um, and the other, you know, significant thing I think is for employment. You know, we know that employment is so crucial to uh, any family's financial sustainability. Um, if there's a family who, you know, they get placed in a job where, let's say, a year after they're no longer enrolled in CWS program, let's say there's a huge layoff at the factory or, or wherever that they're um, working at, um, those folks can actually still utilize employment services for up to five years, actually. Um, so. Good. inspiring and exciting it was good to be here so uh, as for PECWA we have a uh, we have a missions committee here uh, and so if you're a family of PECWA and you're interested in in uh, pursuing this then talk to Willie or Dave and uh, I would love to see us get something going here and uh, for the other churches I don't know Roman you have anything to say you have a team okay 
mm-hmm. um, Wavertown, talk to Chris, or, and then James is here from Bethel. So, yeah, it'd be great to uh, see some teams getting started. Um, all right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, Chris, you want to close with a prayer? All right, let's rise, and then after prayer, you're dismissed.